This standards commission develops and recommends to the State Board of Education rules related to all aspects of educator preparation programs. I'm Michael Marr, Vice Chairman of the Professional Educator Preparation and Standards Commission, and I call this meeting to order. Our agenda and materials are available online through the DPI website, www.ncpublicschools.org, on the SBE meetings link. The meeting is also audio streamed through a link located at the bottom of the eBoard agenda. I will now read the ethics statement that is required of us. Commission members are reminded that it is our duty to avoid conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflicts of interest as we handle the work of this commission. Does any member of the commission know of any conflict of interest or any appearance of conflict with respect to any matters coming before us at this meeting? If so, please state them for the record. If during the course of the meeting you become aware of an actual or apparent conflict of interest, please bring the matter to the attention of the chair. It will then be your duty to abstain from participating in discussion on the matter and from voting on the matter. Mm -hmm. Dr. Seiberg will now call the roll. Uh, Dr. Bullock is absent. Uh, Mr. Childers? Here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dempsey? Present. Thank you. Dr. Fleming? Here. Thank you. Ms. Janeski? Here. Thank you. Mr. McKinney? Present. Thank you. Dr. Graham? Okay. Ms. Hyatt? Dr. Houston is absent. Uh, Mrs. Jones? Here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lockus? Okay. Dr. Locklear? Here. Thank you. I thought I heard you come in. Uh, Ms. Loftus? Okay. Dr. Marr? Dr. McIntyre is here. Here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Miller is absent. Dr. Weddington? Here. And Dr. Wood? Present. Commission members, you've had an opportunity to review the proposed agenda for today's meeting. Do I have a motion to approve this agenda for the December 13, 2018 meeting? So moved. So moved. It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The minutes from our previous commission meeting on November 8, 2018 have been prepared and made available to you. Do I have a motion to approve these minutes? So Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Thank you. Uh, I do want to make one note that we're going to have a slight um, reordering of the agenda. Uh, after we get through uh, Dr. Tomberlin's updates, we're going to skip down. I'm sorry. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to hold on Mr. Snyder until the end of the meeting. Okay. So I now call on Dr. Tom Tomberlin and Dr. Kim Evans to provide the Board of Education updates. Good morning. I wanted everyone to know that TCED 009 passed unanimously at the State Board of Education in December. And then um, also I have one announcement. There's a save the date that I sent everyone earlier that's about uh, North Carolina accreditation community sessions in January on the 10th. Um, it will be hosted by our very own um, Teresa Coogan in Educator Prep. And um, she wanted everyone to know that this is a free session and it's all about CAPE information and there's three different sessions. You can register for one session or two sessions or all three sessions. Um, I will make sure to send out the save the date again for any Pepsi members or any EPP folks that would like to register for that. And registration is open until January 1st, 2019. Are there any questions? Thank you. Okay. Dr. Tom Berlin. Good morning. Good morning. 
um, at the December board meeting, uh, at the December board meeting, I presented to the State Board of Education on the issue of chronic teacher absenteeism. Um, and though this is not a licensure or preparation policy, um, I do think it is a, um, in, it would be of interest to the um, the, the commission to hear what um, the the result of this um, study was and and how the board is considering moving forward. Um, I would like to make this um, fairly brief, um, so I'm just going to cover some highlights. Of course, if you have you have you have a copy of. Did anybody else hear that screeching noise? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, a little bit, yes. That usually means that somebody has their compute connected to their computer and to their phone. All right, I think we, we're, we're clear. Um, all right, great. So I want to uh, just go over some of the highlights. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, and you can read it at your leisure, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the findings or the methodologies. Um, on page 11, <laughs> on slide 11, um, we provide the, um, the general statistics on how many teachers fall into this category of chronically absent. And to be clear about how we counted these folks, these are folks who, um, who take 10 or more absences um, over the course of the school year, but not more than five in a single month. And the reason we excluded those is we figured if those absences are collected within, are concentrated in one pay period, that's probably a significant illness the teacher is experiencing. So we were looking for teachers who had sporadic absences across the year, but totaled 10 or more. And as you can see, about 20% of our educators are chronically absent every year under our definition. Um, on slide 18, we look at the, um, the, the, the number of the... Sorry, I think my numbers are off. There we go. On this slide, you can see that the... Uh, we, we look at how many... how the rate of recidivism, I guess, in chronic absenteeism. How many, what percentage of our teachers are experiencing chronic absenteeism um, over consecutive years? And in the, in the chart on the left, you can see about 5,000 teachers in this sample. We looked over three years. About 5,000 or 7% of our teaching population um, experienced chronic absenteeism every year they were in, um, in the study. Um, and then about 12% experienced it in the two of, two of the three years. And the chart on the right is those teachers that we only had uh, information on for two years. Um, so you can see that there's, um, this is not a, an insignificant population of teachers. So aside from the dis descriptive statistics, we looked at a couple of, um, uh, we, we analyzed the data in a couple ways to look at the impact of, of chronic absenteeism on uh, student growth. Um, and we did this a couple of ways. We looked within school. So teachers within a school, how do they differ from their peers um, if they are chronically absent? And um, what we found there is those teachers who are chronically absent um, experience about three-tenths of an index point lower uh, value-added score than their um, non-chronically absent peers. Uh, this is statistically significant, but we would argue it's not practically significant in that that's well within the normal variation in, in value added from one, from one year to another within a teacher. Next we look at the teachers themselves and whether they, um, compared to other years in which they were not chronically absent, what was the effect of chronic absenteeism on their student growth. And again, the finding is negative, uh, small, significantly, but not practically significant. And then we looked across schools and then in relation to uh, teacher working conditions. And we did not, again, we found um, with across schools, small negative, statistically significant, teacher working conditions did not seem to have any relationship 
uh, statistically significant relationship with teacher absenteeism. Um, we also looked at the differential impact of being chronically absent um, on the school's uh, financial uh, situation. And if you'll move to, I can't see which slide number it is. There we go. So teachers who are chronically absent, as you can see there, miss on average 13 school days per year. A teacher that we don't consider chronically absent on average misses five, around five and a half. And so that difference of 7.62, or roughly seven and a half to eight days, what is the cost to the state in terms of extra um, funding that is needed to cover those, um, those absences? And you can see on the far right, um, it runs about $17 million annually. Um, so chronically absent teachers cost the state an additional $17 million um, a year in substitute teachers than um, non-chronically absent teachers. So the question becomes, how can we develop a policy that respects the fact that teachers have a very difficult job and they need time off and certainly they need sick leave, um, but trying to address this um, uh, high rate of, of absenteeism among our, our faculty. So one thing we looked at were, were the policies related to sick leave. And one of the things we found was that there is a policy uh, for extended sick leave. And extended sick leave in some districts, well, let's first look at the policy and how it's worded here. Um, if you could see the, the piece and uh, the word available in red there, um, extended sick leave is available to teachers once they have exhausted all available accumulated paid leave. So this is 20 additional sick days that a teacher can tap into. The question that we have from the field is what does available mean? Does it mean available on the day that I need to take the absence? And if that's the case, then and if it's an instructional day, the teacher is prevented or precluded from using annual leave or bonus leave on those days. And so some districts interpret this to mean if it's an instructional day and they're out of sick leave, they can tap into these 20 um, sick days. Other districts say available means you, it is on the books for you and you have to use that before the 20, you can access those 20 days. So in addition to that policy, there's another policy for catastrophic illness, where the superintendent at his or her discretion can allow a teacher to use annual leave on an instructional school day if the local superintendent deems that the, um, that the reason is, and there's a host of reasons listed at the bottom there in 3.22, the debilitative nature of the condition, the life-threatening potential, duration, monetary hardship, um, expected mm -hmm. length, other options available to the employee. And so the, the superintendent has very broad discretion in how he or she can allow a teacher to use other forms of leave on an instructional day. What we're proposing to the State Board of Education is that we um, clarify the order of operations of these policies. We would argue that once the sick leave is exhausted, once the um, once a, a teacher's 10 sick days are exhausted in a year, that then they would need to apply for catastrophic illness and, and, and use any of their available leave um, before tapping into the 20 additional um, sick days. And so that's the, um, the discussion that was had in, uh, with State Board of Education and we will bring, be bringing a policy forward um, to, to clarify that. Um, uh, how those, <coughs> those policies interact with one another, but um, we wanted to make sure that the commission was aware of these recommendations and if you have input onto those, this is not a formal policy that I think falls under the commission's purview, but we certainly want to uh, solicit your feedback and your thoughts on, um, on what we're proposing to the board. Tom, this is Glenda. Um, could, could, could this Proposal go to the task force where we've got more HR administrators and superintendents sitting on it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, we need to do that. I I was 
out yesterday. I was out of town yesterday for our um, our task force meeting, and I apologize for that. But yes, we would need to bring that to the teacher recruitment and retention task force. We may do that. We may I, I do think it's June. I do think that we need some clarification there, but it would be just very helpful if we could get the input from um, you know other districts in the state where we're actually having to implement this. Absolutely, we will. Uh, we will bring this back to, uh, to the January uh, recruitment and retention task force. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. Tomlin? Thank you, Dr. Tomlin and Dr. Evans. Next, we'll move to LICN 001, the licensure subcommittee recommendations. Uh, Dr. Tom Tomlin is going to introduce policy changes for LICN 001 as recommended by the Pepsi licensure subcommittee for discussion. Great. Um, <clears throat> the uh, LICN 001, um, we would like to bring it, um, this policy back to the State Board of Education for um, discussion and, and approval um, with the uh, recommended changes from the commission. <clears throat> Uh, and I just want to briefly review those recommended changes with the, um, the commission. Um, on page two of the policy, um, we, we insert a link so that um, folks in, uh, uh, using LICN001 um, can quickly link to the licensure requirements for the various teaching areas uh, that we, we license. Um, it's not really a substantive change, but a change that nonetheless that we need to, to bring before you. On page six of the policy, um, going back to the term proficient, what we, um, we have struck the language that um, changes the definition of proficient um, on June 30th, 2019, that was originally proposed to take effect on June 30th, 2019, um, we will go back to the original definition of proficient, that is a teacher um, has to meet three of the five, has to be proficient on three of the five evaluation standards, with standard four being one of those, or if the teacher's on an abbreviated plan, standard four at least has to be proficient in order to be considered proficient for a variety of um, different opportunities. Um, we, this policy actually, this, lang this definition actually extends into some other policies, TEC, TCED 0016 with the beginning teacher support process. What we're proposing is that we bring this definition with the understanding that everywhere else where proficient is referenced in, in, in state policy, we will use this definition, we will apply this definition uh, when and if the board approves it. Okay, so that would include cooperating teachers for yes. student teachers. That is correct. <clears throat> um, the heart of these changes comes on page eight, and I want to be clear about how we constructed this. So we have a section, um, section 1.21, uh, that deals with license, North Carolina licenses for out-of-state teachers. Um, because we are proposing changes that will take effect um, June 30th, 2019, uh, we feel like we need to keep the one section that's got the rules for right now, and then we added another section that, um, that delineates the rules moving forward um, June, July 1st, 2019. And so for out-of-state educators um, in 21A, uh, we simply state that this section remains valid until June 30th, 2019. And then in 21, uh, 1.21b, um, we, we set the effective date for 7-1-2019. And within that, we, um, we address the issue of comparability of test scores from other states. And on page 11 of the policy in, in uh, section 3, we see educators with three or more years of experience. We've struck the first two, A and B, which requires the test to be comparable. Um, and we state that the out-of-state applicant 
must take a licensure exam which partially meets the requirements for licensure in that state at the time the test was taken. So whatever state you um, were certified in or licensed in, whatever licensure exam was required for, or at least met the partial requirements for that license, um, you have to have that test and show and demonstrate a passing score. And that score needs to be the passing score at the time the exam was taken. Um, and so this allows us to strike this comparability language. Um, and in essence, we would take a valid license from any other state in the country as long as they have a licensure exam. Now, I do want to point out that teachers from Wisconsin who have been recently licensed, since Wisconsin has dropped all of their licensure exams, those teachers would be required under this policy to take our licensure exam. And any other state that that elects not to to um, have a licensure exam. So we'll take any other exam, but there has to be an exam, uh, and that and the teacher has to demonstrate a passing score. Um, most of the other um, changes to this are just clarifying the the fact that the exam has to be um, has to meet the licensing standards of the state at the time that the um, exam was taken. Um, and then we address educators with fewer than three years of experience and at the recommendation of the um, subcommittee we have removed the requirement that teachers with three, less than three years of experience um, have to take the North Carolina exam. They can, if they can demonstrate a passing score from another state, um, if, then we will accept that score. For elementary, however, we have to, we're legally obligated to require a subtest of mathematics and reading. We cannot have just a general single score. We have to have those, those subscores, and those have to be passing scores. Um, I'll take a minute to pause there and see if there's any questions or concerns. So, so I do have it. I do have it. Oh, is that Tom talking? Tom, is that you? It's Michael now, but it was Tom. No, it's Michael. Just talking, Tom or Andrew? Tom. Right, Tom, this is Glenda. I just wanted to, cl to clarify on what you just said about elementary. So those elementary folks that do not have the reading and math subtests from out of state, we are going to allow them to enroll in DPI's reading and mathematics foundations course or take the test, right? That is correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. So my, my question is, uh, is there is there the possibility that in a future date, perhaps a year from now, that we're able to look at the number of teachers who've been licensed from other states and the tests that they are, in fact, taking? I, I'd like to get a sense of the number of teachers who are coming here from other states and, and the kinds of tests that those teachers are taking. My concern is that um, we could end up with this kind of race to the bottom mentality where individuals are seeking out the, the easiest possible state to get licensed, right? Pass those tests and then come in through that kind of this kind of backdoor uh, method. I, I, I think that's. I think that sounds a, sorry. Yeah. I, say, I think that sounds a lot like what Andrew parented yesterday at the T at the um, task force meeting uh, was your concern, Michael. But you know, one of the things that we've done in North Carolina is we've made it under law infinitely easier to for districts to um, terminate teachers that are not performing during their first three years of employment. That's part of legislation, so that's much easier. We've also uh, work with our principals so that they know how to evaluate folks once we get them employed in the building and you know we've actually looked at the research and there's not any correlation out there between the licensure exam and the effectiveness of the teacher you know the staff development that we provide locally in districts um, that's one of the best things that we do to, to grow our teachers into effective teachers I would also say that um, our EPPs in-state um, 
are doing a good job and will continue to do a great job, I think, of weeding out any poor performers during the, the, the preparation process. And just because they finish a the program in North Carolina or somewhere else and they're not successful on a test that bars them from licensure or bars them from becoming a teacher in the classroom, you know, I think that's the challenge we have because right now charter schools, research schools, independent school districts can all hire teachers who don't have a license in anything to teach. So I think that's, I mean, there's so many intricately woven policies out there that are right now preventing us as LEAs from filling critical vacancies that, you know, we're on the right track here. I think for the first time in a very, very long time, and you will hear that from across the state, from HR administrators, from principals, you will hear that from superintendents in the state, um, where they will tell you that we need true reciprocity and we've got to remove barriers. What I think will be interesting is to look at Wisconsin and see later, because they dropped the testing, they dropped that barrier to just see how they're performing or uh, see how they're recruiting more teachers to their study. So, so I'm, I'm not going to disagree with anything you've said. I, I agree with you, Glenda. Um, my only concern, you know, will come up later even when we discuss this kind of draft bill uh, that's being looked at now on the educator preparation dashboard and that, you know, we're essentially holding teacher prep programs to one standard and we're not holding everybody to that same standard and yet the argument around teacher performance always seems to kick back to teacher preparation programs in North Carolina. Uh, so I just want to make sure that there's some accountability on the other end and that we're, we're in fact just looking at data as it becomes available. So. I think I agree with this you, Michael. I think, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I'm sorry, Glenda. This is, this is Joe. And, and from a principal perspective, I think Glenda absolutely uh, hit the nail on the head. You know, with, with the shortage, particularly that so many of our at-risk schools are are facing, it sometimes it simply comes down to whether or not you're going to have a teacher in the room. And and I think Linda's points are very well made. Um, Michael, this is Van. I think I'm um, repeat maybe what Michael said. My concern about this is if you take UNC Wilmington, we might decide not to endorse a candidate for certification on the basis of a standard we have in North Carolina. That student graduates, goes to another state, that state is willing to give them a certificate. They teach in that state for three years. They can then come back into North Carolina and, and ultimately be fully certified. So my issue is not I mean, I do have an issue of uh, reciprocity means we've all agreed to a common standard. And if you meet that standard, you can move across state lines, which is different from we basically have an open transfer process. As long as the higher education institutions can have that same kind of flexibility, then that, le that levels the playing field and it gives principals and personnel offices greater flexibility in hiring. But I think Michael has raised an important point that a person can, in an institution or an EPP, not recommend them for certification, go to another state, need a lower bar, and they can transfer that back in. That's not reciprocity. Reciprocity is we all meet the same standard. Right. So just to clarify on that particular issue, the teacher would not need the teacher would not need to teach for three years in another state. Under this policy, the teacher could immediately could take another could complete at UNC Wilmington. Take um, I'm just going to use Guam because I don't think we have any teachers from Guam. It could take Guam's licensure exam and apply for licensure in North Carolina. Uh, and this had I. I think how we measure the effectiveness of EPPs is secondary to uh, getting teachers in classrooms, but I think this, this particular policy consideration does have impact on how we measure the performance of EPPs. This is going to make that more challenging and we need to think through how that is going to be accomplished. Uh, also, I think uh, teacher recruitment, uh, the, the state of the teaching profession report can help us 
shed, uh, can shed a lot of light on this issue that uh, Mrs. Jones was referencing earlier um, with, uh, with districts having more um, flexibility in, in dismissal. Um, we, we do gather that information every year to see what those rates are and those rates from, from what I've seen have not changed over time with this additional flexibility to dismiss. So I think we need to think about that. And I think it's also important to consider the fact that North Carolina prepared teachers on average are more effective than out of state teachers or lateral entry teachers and their five year retention rate um, or attrition rate is half that of lateral entry or um, out of state prepared teachers. So these are all considerations that need to be, that come into how we create this policy um, and, and what we do, what we ultimately recommend moving forward. So Tom, this is Wednesday again, and, and I don't disagree with some of your points without looking at the data. But what I can tell you is, in the, and we agree, EPP has to have a way to measure. But the bottom line is, we are not producing enough teachers in the state of North Carolina. The bottom line is, I can go to a, my teachers, I mean, I, charter schools can hire folks with no license. They don't have to go through an approved program. They don't have to align with a residency program. Um, our research schools, we can follow the same flexibility that charter schools are allowed. We can do the same thing in the uh, entire independent school districts that we have, like Rowan County right now, where they have the complete charter-like flexibility. And no one can show me that those folks who are just living, breathing bodies with a degree walking into a classroom to teach, are that their data is any better than a teacher that I've hired from out of state somewhere to come in. And we need teachers. I mean, that's the bottom line. There really is some data about that that Kevin Bastion has, has collected. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, the, the, those coming from out of state, according to his data, and some of you have helped me out if, if I'm getting this wrong, are our worst performers. Am I wrong? Maybe I need to check my check those studies, but Kevin Bastion's been doing studies of this, of, of um, the of the impact um, on student achievement of teachers prepared in multiple pathways, um, and out of state is one category, and, and I would, I think that they're always the lowest. Am I am I wrong about that? So I'm going to let um, Dr. Bastian uh, present to the commission, and I'll let him present those findings. Um, I would prefer just to speak about it generally and let him put the numbers behind the data. Yeah, sure, sure. He's not here right now, is he? He is, in fact. <laughs> it's almost as if we planned it. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I have one more little piece of this policy that I need to... Um, review with you, and that's on page 14. Um, in terms of adding teaching areas to existing teacher licenses, um, we've had a couple of pathways um, in place for quite a while. I think that most people are familiar with. Um, we have, however, uh, on the advice of the subcommittee, added a fifth um, uh, possibility, and that's two years of relevant work experience in the past five years. So if the teacher has taught, I assume this is in a private school or some other um, educational setting where they taught that particular content area for two years, then, um, then a teacher who's licensed in another area could, um, could uh, be granted a license if, if that's demonstrated. There was, one, there was one piece to this that I added. Uh, because of the way we do provisional licensing, if it would be possible for a teacher to teach two years on a provisional license and use that two years to uh, to get the other license uh, uh, the other license cleared uh, without taking any coursework or any um, any tests. And so, um, I I myself, not at the at the request of the subcommittee, put in this provision that a provisional license could not be used for this because that would just be a loophole. Um, to get in the license without without any preparation. Um, that 
can be, we can certainly take that out if the commission wants that removed, um, but I just wanted to explain why that particular piece was there. Does, does relevant work experience only relate to K-12 teaching? Um, so I'm a little worried that that's a, that could be a little bit vague, right? Like, so for example, if you have an individual who's teaching and then in the evening teaching math at a community college, could they use community college teaching experience or could they use higher education teaching experience, right? Or are we talking about exclusively K-12 experience? I just think we need to spell that out if that's in fact the case. Sure. Doesn't and, that provisional license there help with that as a qualifier? Because it would have a provisional license to be up for LEA in order to be gaining that experience. I'm a little confused. Does that clarify that for you, Michael? No, I think I'm still confused by the two. So, Ms. Jones, I want to be clarify that the work experience accrued while working under a provisional license cannot be used to clear the license. So, in, in Dr. Marr's example, I'm teaching social studies in a high school, but I teach math for the community college in, at night. Can I use the math experience in the community college setting to qualify for an add-on licensure in mathematics? So if the person, I, I understand what he's asking there, so that may require some different clarification, but the two years of relevant work experience in the past five years, if that teacher has been on a provisional license working in that area, why would we put that as a qualifier that that would not count? How else would they gain that experience if they're not licensed in the area? So my understanding was this was work outside of the traditional K-12 system. And what I was trying to, uh, what I was identifying earlier was <laughs> This just creates a loophole that if you put a teacher, if you provisionally license your PE teacher to be your physics teacher for two years, then that teacher could have a clear physics license without taking any physics courses or, or the exam. taking an exam, just by virtue of the fact that the LEA decided to employ them in that, in that role. And the provisional license has its own set of requirements as listed in 150 right. that would need to be modified if we were going to use that as a vehicle for clearing the license. So I guess my question is could, could you just add either, either add two years of relevant K-12 work experience or do we really just want to say two years of relevant because who's going to determine the relevant work experience? My assumption would be that the, the licensure staff would, would determine the, the relevance. And I think we're back to the original problem that we had with comparable in the licensure exam. Who's making that determination and um, licensure um, folks? I think this needs to be defined more clearly if what we, what we consider so, to be relevant. So an example would be if, a, you know, I hired a teacher to work in one of my restart schools that doesn't have to have a license right now. And under the law, I can do that. Sure. And they teach science for three years in that restart school without a license because they can legally do that. So now, are under the, under the way you worded that, would we be able to get that person a license in the state of North Carolina to teach science or whatever? No, because they didn't have a license to add. That's what the problem is going to be. We're going to run into that. The more restart schools and independent school districts we get, the more difficult it's going to be to um, to even during the transfer process. So let's say allotments get cut at a particular building. And typically, we look at the licensure areas to see if we can move those teachers somewhere else. Well, if they've never gotten a license, but they've been teaching for the past four years or five years in that school, that's the only school that I can employ them in. But now, am I displacing somebody that's a veteran teacher that has a license in that area and moving them over to a school that requires a license? If I can't use that provision, and I think that was part of the issue was there are people that maybe do not have a degree in that area, uh, but that's something that is an expert. Um, 
they're an expert in. It could be they're teaching community college at night and they've been teaching it for five years, back to Michael's point, or an active professor for science, but they only teach math, or they only teach social studies, or they only teach PE. I think that's what we were trying to get at with that verbiage. Uh, I, that helped clarify, and, and so I would my response to that would be I think this is the wrong place to try to achieve that goal because you're talking about an actual path to licensure this uh, in your scenario so under this provision the teacher would already hold a clear license in some other subject and so if you had to transfer that teacher from a restart school to a different school you would have to put them in the license area for which they hold the clear license so um, but, your larger issue remains relevant in that a, a teacher that you bring on in your district in a restart school, they are free from the requirements of licensure. That is correct. But you're recognizing an issue that I'm dealing a lot with with LEAs is what happens to that teacher moving forward? Are they confined to those, to those districts? And the flexibility extend as long as you remain outside of the licensure system that flexibility exists but once you enter a teacher into the licensure process then the flexibility is no longer exists they have to conform to the state board policies related to licensure so if we need to change if that's the if that's what we want to change and address that would have to be done in a different part of the policy i think so I don't think that's all, Tom. That's one example. This originally, I think, originated with the fact that we've had to collapse a number of, of positions in our districts across the state because we don't have enough teachers. And we are collapsing them and we're asking other teachers that are certified in those areas to take on those, either buy back, if it's a secondary position, we're buying back their planning periods and asking them to stay that extended amount of time after the school day to make that up and then to take on an extra class of students because we don't have a science teacher. But I might be able to go find somebody in my building as a principal that I know that maybe they, um, you know, they work with um, some club after school or they do something as an adjunct professor or some other area where I know they've got an expertise. Maybe they were a teacher assistant for a number of years in a particular area and they just got that something that they um, are a, a area of strength for them. Well now if I want to um, add an area, yep, I can add a provisional license to it, but if they have had years of experience you know, however they got the experience working in that area, that just create, continues to create an issue for us. And I thought what we were really trying to do with this policy is to give more flexibilities for school districts in order to fill those vacancies. And, you know, if I can hire a lateral entry teacher and bring, and no offense to lateral entry, um, because we have some great lateral entry teachers, but if I can hire them and bring them in to teach the same thing, and they don't even have any pedagogy whatsoever. They don't have any traditional experience, but they're considered qualified. I'm getting feedback now, I'm not sure why, but. But if they're considered qualified to teach and these other folks are not, that's a problem for school districts. Uh, I, I don't disagree. I, I think, um, all I'm trying to communicate is we need to find, I, I think what you're talking about is a, is a separate licensure path. And um, I think this, this piece could stay in the provisional section. We could certainly talk about that. Um, and I will leave it to the commission to, to think about um, the idea of provisionally licensing someone and then not following through with that provisional licensing requirement and just granting them the clear license after two years. That, that's the issue for what, what's in, one, um, in 120, 122. Um, however, if we want to build this separate path to licensure based on um, employment and potentially demonstrated mastery, 
that would require a, a different licensure path somewhere else in the in the policy. This is and, and I just I disagree with Stephen. I, I just wanted to say I, I think part of the the difficulty here is that we we have such a dearth right now and, and I think Linda's feeling that and the principal that was speaking that uh, and I think that there needs to be some way that we can get somebody hired and then work through the process. I, I don't I don't know if that means it a separate commission that does this that allows the district to hire someone and then work through this so that we can have that teacher in the classroom. And I think that's part of the, the, the you know, the fear here is that we really need teachers in our buildings and in our classrooms. And so, I, you know, so I, I'm, I'm not sure the best process right now, but I, I feel that being needed. Okay, so, so I feel like we're talking about two different things. Um, from kind of an outsider's perspective, right? As I, I absolutely agree with everything that's been said. I, I you know, I, I would echo the challenges we have in the state with the teacher shortage. Uh, we have certainly shortages in teacher preparation and enrollment. This is this is a huge issue in our state. But it but it seems to me that when we look at this particular policy, 1.22 is really about adding a license to an existing license. It's not about bringing people in per se. It's about those individuals who already hold. A license and so the only question I had when I brought this up initially was about the areas of this idea of, a, of relevant work experience so this is if you if you have a teacher who's already employed and you want to and they're a licensed teacher and you want to move them from one area to another they teach in that area for two years they're able to add that area without any additional barriers that that's my understanding right however if you have a lateral entry teacher that teacher cannot use two years of teaching experience to be granted a license. This is about adding a license to an existing one, not granting a new one. And so what, what really this policy, the way I see it, is it just doesn't create a loophole for individuals to come in, teach for two years, and then be exempt from any uh, licensing or coursework requirements. Is that, is that correct, Dr. Tom? Uh, that was the purpose of, of adding the second sentence. Correct. Just to prevent that. Little. This is Linda again, and I would, I would say if we go so, back and look to how, when we did No Child Left Behind, we did something very similar by looking to see what teachers had experience teaching, and then we were able to add those areas. Now, I understand No Child Left Behind is gone, but during that time frame, we went back and we looked at, and they were able to go through a process called how. So that we can get them certified to teach because of the highly qualified requirements and these were teachers who had experience teaching and a lot of times it was our um, special ed teachers who um, needed to be certified in all the different areas and they had spent years teaching math science social studies and language arts and then we were able to add that to their license because of the uh, experience that they had. And I think that was the entire goal here with this provision was for us to be able to fill vacancies and, you know, internally with existing staff and add an area to their license without adding uh, all this additional work on top of that and testing on top of that. Because right. if they're not effective doing it, we're gonna deal with that at the LEA level. Right, Glenda, I think, I think you and I, yeah, you and I are on the same side of this issue. We're, we're not arguing um, cross purposes, I guess, right? We're, we're on the same side. Um, I'm, not, I'm not asking for additional work or additional testing. Um, I was just merely clarifying that the individuals already hold a clear license, that it's not uh, laterals. And I just wanted us to clarify the two years of relevant work experience and whether or not that pertains to K-12 teaching experience or other kinds of experience and if it's other kinds of experience then who would make the determination of whether or not that work experience was relevant so could that be k-12 and university level experience because i would argue that a university teacher whether they're adjunct or full-time teaching yep. math Sure, and, and I would be good with that. K twelve or K twelve or post secondary teaching experience within the discipline. Absolutely. So if I might propose that um, we rework this 
this particular provision, uh, we're not in a tremendous rush here. These things won't go into effect until July 1, 2019, with uh, the 1920 licensing um, season. And if the, if the commission would like to decide whether the other provisions that um, essentially grant reciprocity on testing, um, if, if the commission would like to move that forward, we could, we could bring that to the State Board of Education um, as, a separate, as a separate piece and, and rework this um, uh, work experience provision. Okay. So, so the recommendation would be to move forward the Go ahead. Uh, just out of curiosity about what's the number on average of, of instances where this takes place, where we would need, like how many of these do we have on a yearly basis? I think that's difficult to answer because it seems to be okay. more and more this year where um, we have collapsed. I mean, I can count off the top of my head right now six positions, and I'm sure I have more that I've had to collapse. And we've had to seek people within the buildings to be able to buy back their planning series. And that's just Cabarrus County. Uh, okay. there are all so potentially just to come be up on a day there. across the state? Oh, I have no idea. I have no idea. Okay. 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 So, so the recommendation is to move forward with changes, policy changes for LICN 001, with the exception of section, uh, with the exception of the changes to section 1.22. Is that correct, Dr. Shaman? I make that motion. I make that motion. Second. 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 Okay, so, Second. so it's been properly moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Michael, that's properly moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I'm not aware of the single EPC that wants to compare. Dr. Dempsey, you're cutting out. We, we missed the first part of what you said. I said, I don't, I don't want the message from the previous conversation to be that there are EPCs that are tended uh, to limit or restrict, <clears throat> excuse me, the number of teachers provided to North Carolina. If some of the flexibility that we're talking about through other routes into the profession are given to the EPPs, we can prepare more teachers. But we don't have that flexibility because we have to meet a higher standard. If we were given greater autonomy to determine on behalf of the state, we believe a person is qualified to teach in spite of performance on a particular indicator, I guarantee you we're going to put more teachers out into the profession and then let principals and personnel offices and superintendents decide should they stay in the profession. But I, back to one of the points Linda raised earlier, not only am I not interested in limiting the number, I want to grow the number, but I need the autonomy to help do it. Thank you, Dr. Dempsey, to your point, I think that's something that the commission ought to be able to take up in a separate policy, something that we could work on to give more flexibility to our EPPs. Because we certainly, I certainly agree with you, and I don't think you'll find anybody um, at the uh, LEA level that will disagree with that, from superintendents on down. But I do think that's something that we need to work on separately from us being able to staff our buildings right now. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none, I call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain. Dr. Weddington will abstain. Thank you, Dr. Tom Berlin. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Kevin Bastian, Senior Research Associate and Associate Director for, edu for the Education Policy Initiative at Carolina to present data on the Pearson licensure exams. His presentation is part of the data requested during the November uh, Pepsi meeting for the recommendation for the math content exam. Thank you, Dr. Mar. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. I'll assume silence is also yes. Um, all right, so uh, thank you uh, very much to the commission and to 
Dr. Tomerlin, etc., for the opportunity to present um, today. I'm going to talk about the Pearson licensure exams um, and the extent to which they predict the performance of early career teachers. Um, this is work um, we've done at Epic with um, Christina Patterson, who's actually now at Georgia Southern. And I um, certainly want to acknowledge the UNC system for their support and funding of this work. Um, so it makes they make a lot of the research we're able to do in North Carolina possible. I want to give just a little bit of background today on the suite of three Pearson licensure exams, um, and then mostly uh, discuss the analyses we performed. Um, and to do that, talk a little bit about our sample and what outcome measures we're looking at for teachers, uh, how, we're, how we've taken Pearson licensure exam scores and turned them into measures for analyses, um, give a little bit of descriptive data on those who uh, pass versus do not pass the exams on their first attempt, um, and then talk about our results for EVOS and evaluation ratings. Uh, so just as a little bit of background, although I don't think uh, this group would need much, um, there's a suite of three Pearson licensure exams for elementary and exceptional children general curriculum licensure areas. The first, Foundations of Reading, um, assesses knowledge of reading development, comprehension, instruction, and assessment, and conceptually, you know, a teacher's performance on this exam should be related to um, their student's achievement in either early grades reading, which we can assess with the M class, or um, upper elementary grades reading through the reading EOG, for instance. Uh, the second of the of three exams is the general curriculum multi-subject, um, and this assesses um, knowledge of language arts, history and social sciences, and science and technology. Um, and of course, what that sort of means is Roughly only a third of, of the test is each of those parts, um, so it's a little hard to look at um, candidates or beginning teachers' performance on this assessment and um, EVOS assessments in a particular subject area, for instance, because there's a lot of different parts in that exam, right? Um, the final of the three Pearson licensure exams is the mathematics um, assessment. It's assessing knowledge of numbers and operations, functions and algebra, geometry and measurement, and statistics and probability. Um, here again, conceptually, um, we should be able to look at its relationship with teachers' uh, value-added or EVOS estimates in upper elementary grades on the mathematics EOG. So a few details about our sample um, and what outcomes we're looking at. So we're going to look um, our, our research sample is 1,121 teachers, so individuals paid as teachers in the state's public schools, who have less than three years of experience in the 14, 15, through 16, 17 school years, and they have scores on all three of the Pearson licensure exams. So that's our sample. Um, we're going to look at two different outcome measures. EVOS estimates from the state's early grades reading, so the M class reading 3D, and then EOG exams in grades 3 through 6. So that would be reading in grades 3 through 6, math for grades 4 and 5, um, four, or sorry, 4 through 6, and science in grade 5. And we'll also look at evaluation ratings on each of the five professional teaching standards. And we standardize both the EVOS estimates and the evaluation ratings so that we can interpret the relationship between teachers' performance on the licensure exams um, and these measures as sort of a standard deviation um, and what you might call teacher effectiveness or teacher performance. We perform two basic models, more or less, screening and signaling. So a screening model is going to assess, um, in our case, we're going to make a screening model assess whether those who passed a particular licensure exam on the first try, whether they're more effective than uh, a peer who did not. So, for example, we might assess whether those who pass foundations of reading on the first attempt have higher EVOS estimates from the M class than uh, a peer who did not pass foundations of reading on the first try. Our signaling models don't really look at whether someone's passed or not, they're just asking the question of whether those with higher licensure exam scores are more effective than those with lower scores. Um, so again, to give an example, we might be asking whether those who score a standard of a deviation higher on the mathematics licensure exam, um, do they have higher value-added estimates in upper elementary grades 
uh, mathematics. And all of these analyses we're going to control for characteristics of the teacher, the students, their teaching um, using the roster data and student demographic information, and characteristics of the schools they're working at to better isolate those relationships between exam performance and teacher outcomes. So this next slide is a descriptive slide uh, for the, and I want to be clear, for the 1,121 teachers in our, early career teachers in our sample, um, is a descriptive slide showing some basic teacher characteristics in the top panel and school characteristics in the bottom panel, or, or middle panel, I guess, technically, of, of people who passed each of the respective uh, assessments on their first attempt and those who did not. Um, to be clear, this isn't sort of a larger pass rate. This isn't a cohort pass rate. You know, this is very um, generalized to this particular sample. Um, you can see at the bottom uh, the first time pass rates for, on each of the three respective exams um, for, for this sample, that 1,121 teachers. So about 77% for foundations of reading, 79% for the multi-subject exam, and about two-thirds, 66% for mathematics. Um, so what's important uh, from my perspective in this table, or what stands out? Um, I think three things. First, um, if you look at the top when it comes to teacher demographics, um, minority teachers make up a much higher percentage of those who initially uh, do not pass the exam. So if you look at um, foundations of reading, um, minority teachers make up about make up 9.35% or so of the teachers who pass on the first attempt, but one quarter, 25.51% of those who fail foundations of reading on their first attempt. You see similar patterns for the other two Pearson exams. Um, foreshadowing the predictive validity results I'm going to show in a minute. Um, you'll see up in the top panel there's a row for a composite evaluation rating. All we've done there is sum teachers' ratings across the five standards um, and their an EVOS index. Um, and you'll see the biggest difference between those who pass and fail in the first attempt um, for those teacher performance measures are for foundations of reading and, and the differences for the multi-subject and the mathematics exam are pretty minimal. Um, and finally, in the bottom, when you're looking at school characteristics, um, these aren't particularly uh, large differences to my mind, um, but you do see that those who initially pass uh, these licensure exams tend to be working in schools with slightly uh, fewer economically disadvantaged and minority students and schools that are slightly higher performing, whether you're looking at uh, a performance composite, the school performance grade, or the percentage of schools that were low performing. And before I move into the um, value added and evaluation actual results, I'll just pause really quick to see if anybody has a question thus far. Nope, I got Okay, so we're going to look at predictive validity now. We're looking at the relationships between two licensure exams, and you see it over on the left side, foundations of reading at the top and the multi-subject exam at the bottom, and teachers' EVOS estimates in K-2 through reading, so this is from the M class, and it's particularly from uh, the TRC, the text reading and comprehension portion of that exam, so that's where teachers get an EVOS estimate. The red bars are results from our screening analyses. And again, that's asking whether those who uh, initially pass are more effective than those who initially fail. The blue bars from signaling analyses, just asking whether a higher score is predictive of performance. Um, again, sort of throwing out that caveat that the multi-subject exam is not just about reading or English language arts, so um, we have less of an a priori sense that it should predict teacher value added in K2 reading, for instance. But what we do see here is that those who pass foundations of reading on the first attempt have value added estimates for K2 reading that are 21% of a standard deviation higher than their peers who initially fail the exam. Um, that's statistically significant. And to benchmark that result a little bit for you, um, we often try to do that by looking at the average difference in the effectiveness between first and second year teachers. Um, and that difference varies based on the test or the grade level, um, but across sort of all tests, looking at EVOS estimates, 
the average mm -hmm. difference in effectiveness between a first and a second year teacher is about 15% of a standard deviation. So um, this gives you a sense that it's a slightly larger difference perhaps than the average difference between a first and second year teacher, if that makes it a little bit more meaningful. Um, the signaling result for foundations of reading isn't statistically significant. You, you'll see it's not, um, there's no asterisk or anything like that up there, that 8.5. But I would note that in a separate model, um, when we control for, when we're looking at K2 reading and we control for both the foundations of reading score and the multi-subject exam score at the same time, uh, the signaling result for foundations of reading is positive and significant. Um, lastly, at the bottom, and again, um, this isn't necessarily surprising, but there's no uh, relationship between the multi-subject exam and uh, K2 reading teacher value added. Oh, uh, that's good. <laughs> Glad to hear that. All right, so now we turn to upper elementary grades. So we're shifting away from the M class to the end of grade exam. And for in signaling analyses or screening analyses for foundations of reading or the multi-subject exam, you know, there's no relationship, statistically significant relationship between um, early career teacher scores on the assessments um, and their value-added estimates. Now looking at math. Dr. Bastian, could, yep. you, Dr. Bastian, could you say that last statement again for me? I'm sorry, I missed it. Yeah, that's fine. So we're, um, we're looking at uh, teachers' EVOS estimates and uh, grades 3 through 6 right. reading, so the EOG. And what we see here is in uh, neither in the screening or signaling analyses, nor for you know, foundations of reading or the multi-subject exam, none of those results are statistically right. significant. So no relationship. <clears throat> No statistical significance at all with that small sample, right? Yeah, for the sample we have, there's no significant relationship between these two Pearson exams and upper elementary grades reading. Thank you. Certainly. Makes sense to me. So, um, our last value added slide um, this is looking at um, scores on the general curriculum mathematics Pearson exam and teachers EVOS estimates in grades four through six math. Um, much like the previous slide, there is no relationship here between teachers mathematics exam scores and the uh, EVOS estimates that they, that they receive in, in mathematics. Um, I would say that to, to sort of dive into this one just a little bit further and give a little bit more interpretation, it's a relatively small sample here. I think it's um, 300 to 400 cases, as I remember. But it's not as if, the estimates are also not large, I'll say that. Um, it's not as if we have very large estimates and we just sort of don't have statistical power to detect an effect at this point. Um, at least with this sample, these are relatively small estimates as well. Um, all right, so now we're going to shift to look at another, you know, certainly relevant uh, teacher outcome, and that's the evaluation ratings on the state's five professional teaching standards. Um, since evaluation ratings are sort of content neutral, at least relative to EVOS where it's for fifth grade math, hypothetically, right? Um, our main analyses that we're seeing on this slide, um, slide 10, are considering how performance on all three licensure exams sort of as a whole or at the same time is predicting evaluation ratings. So the red bar, the screening analyses, what we're looking at is uh, whether a candidate or a teacher passed all three licensure exams on the first try. Are those who pass all three on the first try more effective than those who fail at least one on the first try? And what we see, all those red bars for, you know, for each of the five standards are positive and statistically significant. Um, so they are, you know, they are pe people who pass all three on the first attempt are receiving higher evaluation ratings. Um, for instance, to give an example, those who pass all three in the first attempt have uh, ratings on the facilitating student learning standard about 12% of a standard deviation higher than peers who have failed at least one of the exams on their first attempt. Um, to put this into perspective for you, again, benchmarking it against first and second year teachers, um, 
The, the average evaluation rating differences between a first and a second year teacher is about a third of a standard deviation or 33% of a standard deviation. So um, these are actually smaller in some ways in magnitude than the EVOS K2 you know, foundations of reading result we saw earlier. We also averaged teachers' scores on all three licensure exams. Um, and then we predicted whether their average score standardized is predicting evaluation ratings, that's the blue bar, um, the signaling analyses. And we see that for four out of the five standards, um, higher scores uh, on all three of the tests combined are also predicting higher um, evaluation ratings. To dive into those evaluation results just a little bit more, um, we wanted to be able to see if there's, if there's a particular assessment in the three licensure exams um, that sort of carry more of the weight and is more predictive of evaluation ratings. So slide 11 is showing um, a model seeing whether foundations of reading the multi-subject or the mathematic exam is, pre is, is especially predictive. And what we see here is that, again, it's sort of foundations of reading there that is predicting higher, um, higher evaluation ratings on three of the five standards, leadership, classroom environment and reflecting on practice. Um, and there's insignificant results for everything else. Mm. So I would wrap up, you know, or at least start the wrap up by saying these are, you know, relatively early analyses with you know, with a relatively small sample, particularly when, um, you know, it's about 1,120 teachers again. Um, and I think what that really means is, I, I, I guess what, what I'd like to then say is, this research can certainly guide evidence-based decisions, and it should, um, with sort of the caveat and the caution that, um, you know, those decisions shouldn't be taken too far for the data we currently have, right? Um, as a summary, again, results indicate that the foundation's reading scores are predicting higher EVOS estimates in K2 reading, but not for upper elementary grades in reading. The general curriculum multi-subject exam is unrelated to EVOS estimates in K2 reading and for the upper elementary grades reading. I would add that we did run analyses looking at the relationship between the multi-subject exam and EVOS estimates in fifth grade science because part of the multi-subject exam does have science. Nothing was statistically significant, but they were, uh, particularly in the screening analysis, it was, a, it was decently positive. It was, a, it was a fairly large coefficient, but the sample size was about 120. Um, so there, it, it seemed um, underpowered at that point. The mathematics exam is unrelated to EVOS estimates in upper elementary grades and, and, and sixth grade. Um, and again, results are more robust and positive for the evaluation ratings. Um, I think particularly for foundations of reading, you know, and, and how I, I think there could be very fruitful or interesting conversations intellectually about how you sort of interpret the value-added EVOS piece versus more the subjective principle evaluation piece. I do just, uh, Wesley, um, has this information been shared with our state board and, and or our legislators? Tom, do you want to, I mean, I, I don't believe so, no. I mean, this is something that um, we've shared within the UNC system and the UNC system office a little bit, and things that we've, that have been shared, you know, with Dr. Tomberlin uh, here at DPI, but I don't believe in beyond that. Yeah, and I believe this was done for us because we're, particularly because we're having the conversation about these three particular licensure exams. This is Lyndon. I guess my question would be on all of that. When I look at the high-level takeaways that uh, Dr. Bachelor or someone put together there, I think that's a lot of that supports what we've been talking about, not just as a commission, but in the field. And to Dr. McIntyre's point about the foundations of reading being um, a strong indicator, I think that even though this is a relatively small sample, that you do have some data to support that. I guess what I, we would still argue from the field would be that we can provide the Reading Foundation staff development. That, that, you know, I understand that some of the best staff development that our teachers go through 
and that would prepare them better than just taking the test and, and, and indicating by the fact that I can pass the test, I'm a better teacher. Um, and I understand some of your, your, your data here indicates that, um, even though it's a small sample, but, but I think that's the one thing that we would continue to say is that there's just not a correlation all the way through here with the exception of maybe the reading foundations, but that could pre be provided at the district level with state trained um, trainers. Dr. Tomlin. Yeah. I, I have a question for Dr. Bastian um, that didn't occur to me till I've seen this before, but it just occurred to me. The relationship between the evaluation ratings and is that between the evaluation ratings and the licensure exam, performance on the licensure exam? So this goes back to the original statement of um, so Ms. Jones, how, I, I would like to hear your thoughts on on that, if we're saying the LEAs can determine whether a teacher's ready um, or good enough for the job, but what we're saying, what, what this data suggests is your method for doing that is highly correlated with the licensure exam, even though it's not correlated with EVOS. So, why would, are you getting my point here that? If the exam is telling us whether you in the LEAs are going to find that teacher to be effective or highly effective in your evaluation process, then what really is the argument for removing the exam when it's giving us that indication, when it is signaling whether you're going to say that's a good teacher or not? So in that regard, it seems to be your own evaluation seems to be re reinforcing the licensure exams validity in this case and well, I would I like your opinion on that you, Tom, um, because there's I think you said the sampling was like 1121 and I think what you would find that there may be some disparity across the state with how the evaluation system has been implemented um, I think that's one of the reasons we're looking at now the, prin the principal evaluation system at um, tweaking that and, and bringing that more into date with what we are expecting of our administrators. I don't think you can tie the um, this very low sampling of um, research to um, as a as a um, I guess a um, something that validates that licensure should or that testing should be a barrier to licensure and that principals are not doing their jobs with evaluating teachers. The evaluation model is a growth model. It's not um, you know this uh, instrument where we just check off the boxes. It's a growth model. So we get a beginning teacher in that first year and over the years we expect them to grow on that model. Um, you know I, I don't know that I can really defend what every district is doing in the state in that area but what i can say is that that should not be the correlation that we utilize to say that we're not going to give flexibility to teachers and, and granting them licensure in the state of north carolina tom there's also a lot of other factors to think about as well as far as the VT support plan or coaching that's involved the resources that the district has so I think there's a lot of other factors that can impact that data as well. So, so it seems like because there's a, there is the potential for a high degree of variability across the state, and and given the perhaps small sample size, the, the results are are valid. They're, they are statistically significant, um, re regardless of the sample size at this point. It, it would it would in my judgment, it, it seems that the results would indicate that the test is an important indicator when we think about. Uh, performance, particularly in early grades reading, uh, as well as in, in evaluation across the, the NISA standards for at least four of those five. And so the, the test would be a, an important measure for us as we continue to um, think about accountability and standards for beginning teachers. I mean, I guess Michael, I... Michael, with your point, I guess I have a question there. Have we taken in, into consideration the teachers, did the data include those teachers who maybe had the reading foundations professional development as opposed to those who took the test? Great question. No, I mean, because here we're, we're, we're literally looking at the relationship between their test scores and 
and you know, they're, they're measures of performance, either EVOS or evaluation ratings. Um, so if someone doesn't have a test score, you know, then they can't sort of and, and show the first in the pass model. means they wouldn't have taken those workshops, correct? Glendon? If, if they if they've passed the, the licensure exam, would they take those workshops? So. I wouldn't I think, think so, right? I don't think so. And oh, even yeah. some people who I, I mean, failed it might still. You have districts right now that are proposing that we be able to give the Reading Foundations training in lieu of making them take that test. Um, and that's one of the things that we tried to address in the LIC and 001, that if they're coming in from out of state, instead of having to take the test, they, they could have the option of taking the test, or they could take take the Reading Foundations or the Math Foundations training. Well, that, that would be interesting Again, data to see say, later on. Right? Sorry. I think that would be interesting data to see in the future. I guess, trying to think uh, more broadly and, and step back, I suppose, um, a couple of high-level thoughts. First, just because these are three required assessments now for these two licensure areas, doesn't mean that you have to treat them, at least from my perspective, doesn't mean you have to treat them all the same. In, in some sort of decision about what to do with Pearson licensure exams, by which I simply mean um, if you decide to eliminate or tweak one, that doesn't mean, of course, that you would need to do that for all three. I think that's um, you know, worth stating, although I think clear. Um, second, if you, I, I guess there's a couple qualifications in an exam, and I can't speak to all these qualifications, but you would want a licensure exam to sort of meet, to be used for high stakes decisions. Um, certainly you'd want, you know, reliability. We haven't looked at that. Um, second, you would, you would sort of want alignment. And I know we haven't, but I know others have certainly talked about the alignment between some of these exams and what then teachers in these uh, grades are being asked to teach, right? You, you want that alignment there. You want reliability. And then you want what we're looking at. You want predictive validity, right? You want to be able to say, um, to a teacher that if you're going to make a high stakes decision about his or her uh, employment or potential employment, that there is actually a relationship there between how they're going to score um, or you know, how they score and then how they're going to do on average. And, I, and this is all on average. And I think you know, that's worth saying too. You know, there's, there are teachers who don't pass and then do well. There are teachers who pass and then don't do well as teachers. But on average, um, these are the relationships we're seeing. So I think, you know, all that's worth saying. I mean, clearly the state has a, a role in ensuring that its teachers, and, and, and the states do this in multiple ways, you know, having educator prep programs with certain requirements, having licensure exams, etc. But this, a state, North Carolina, certainly has a role in ensuring that um, the people that come in to teach its children are prepared to do so. Um, I think licensure exams are, are certainly one way to go about that. Um, and I, I think I, you know, that can sort of stop there, some high-level thoughts on sort of what these results might mean. Oh, oh this is Hank. And Glenda, I, I think one other thing that I think about with this is, the, especially the, the foundations of reading tests, the other two I, I don't see any use for right now, the, the ones that we've selected. but. It provides a particular kind of quality control for our EPPs in that up until the time we had the Pearson exam, it wasn't always true that every university was using research-based reading foundations teaching in their programs, um, phonemics-based teaching. Um, they were all over the place. This test at least makes sure that the coursework is aligned with what we know is true about reading, especially K2 reading, and those early interventions. Um, I think if you take that away, you might see some of that slip away from some of our programs, and I wouldn't want that to happen. Um, and I don't think that's a good practice for the state. Maybe. Hi, this is um, Robin Hyatt. I just wanted to weigh in um, with a point, just thinking about is there a strong correlation between the exam and the course? I have taken the course um, before, and it is, it's high quality, it's great professional development. 
I felt like it was centered a lot on diagnosing reading problems and the interventions that teachers need to use to address those. So it was, I don't feel like it was comprehensive enough for a general ed setting. But however, I mean, it was great. But I'm not sure that it would directly correlate with the exam. Have you taken the exam? I have not. I wonder if we could find people who have done both, both taken the exam and taken the PAC. I might have somebody in my faculty actually who's done both. I could ask her. She too says the course is fantastic. So it's an interesting question. I guess a last thought. And this is, and perhaps this is coming from an academic position. And so I recognize in saying it, it may be not, it certainly doesn't ring true with many on this commission's present reality who are actually, you know, principals, teachers, district employees, et cetera. But I think there should be some caution in making decisions in the current state of teacher shortages when they didn't used to, they're somewhat cyclical. They weren't always the case. And if I had to bet something, I would say they might not be again. And part of that's, and so I guess I would just sort of say that removing barriers to entry, which you might call licensure exams, now in response to a current situation may be reasonable, but X number of time from now, and of course they could always be reinstated, but X number of years from now, that situation could be quite different, hypothetically. And then you may be in a position where it'd be nice to be able to have more quality control. So I'll say that as well. Great point. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bastian. Thank you. So Dr. Tomerlin will follow up with the policy changes to LICN 003 for discussion and action. Actually, Dr. Tomerlin just stepped away. Can we take a, we're going we're gonna to take perhaps a five minute recess, if that's okay with everybody, and then we'll reconvene right at 10.35. The mic's back on. Okay, we're ready to reconvene. <clears throat> And so now Dr. Tom Rillen will follow up with the policy changes to LICN 003 for discussion and action. Uh, hello again. Um, so LICN 003 um, is coming before the commission um, to, um, to reflect some feedback on the, the requirement of uh, licensure tests for elementary school teachers, the um, the legislation requires that a t that that a elementary teacher have a subtest of mathematics and reading. And given that the um, multi-subject test is not in legislation, uh, we're recommending that that assessment be removed from the requirements. I mean, we can do so without any legislative action. Um, also. The recommendation to um, to change the mathematics test from Pearson 203 um, to the uh, Praxis 7803, the CKT math um, subtests. Um, and for the required score here, we have talked to the um, to the testing company, and this is a a recommended nationally normed score that they're recommending. But we can certainly um, as we, as we uh, implement this test, we can look at the uh, performance and adjust that score accordingly. Um, and we make it clear that this is for licenses with an effective date of 7-1-2019 or later. So this would, this would not be an option for anybody who, is current, who, has, a, who has a licensure expiration date of 7-30-2018, 2019, I'm sorry, 6-30-2019. 
it would it would go into effect um, with the 7-1-2019 group. And the concern is that it would be for the next two years. Absolutely. And I guess my fear here is we're going to end up in the same predicament going into this next year with our currently staffed folks that we've gotten a permit to teach. You know, not the ones outside of the normal permit, the ones that didn't pass by the end of their second year. And if we put the date off and um, to, to July 2019, why can't we just make that effective right now and the folks can have the option of doing it? Is there a reason why we can't do that? Um, you understand well, what I'm asking? Sure. So I, I think the only reason, the reason that we considered when we talked about this was um, equity for those folks who are involved. So those teachers who took the test multiple times and eventually passed it, um, I think they certainly, I, and when I'm talking about um, Pearson 203, um, we just thought that that would be unfair that we change the rules of the game in the middle of the game um, for all those teachers. And um, Not really, because they passed the test. They're, they're licensed, they're not in danger now of not having a job. Districts are not in danger of having another vacancy because these same teachers that we got a permit to teach across the state because they teach, teach what we're actually doing. And I understand, I mean, I, I do understand the rationale there. It's just we're going to end up with the same issue again. We've got teachers who are taking the, that same Pearson 203 over and over and over and are not passing it. And it's Costs coming out of their pocket at thirty-five thousand dollars a year as a beginning teacher, or a second-year teacher, or a third-year teacher. What other reason outside of equity is there that we can't go ahead? If we're going to, we're going to, as a commission say, we're going to go with the Pearson Foundations of Reading because of this reason, and now we're going to go with the uh, Practice Seventy Eight Hundred Three. We're going to eliminate the general curriculum test. Why not give that as an option right now instead of putting it off to July? I, I agree with Linda's, Linda's well, man. I think if we were looking at equity and we just arbitrarily changed the test, then that would be a concern. But uh, we changed the test because the data indicated that we needed to to, to help our uh, teacher shortage. Well, well I, I think that's right. Yeah, I don't know that we need to change. Sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't, I don't know that we're changing the test specifically because of the teacher shortage, but rather we're changing the test because the test is not indicative of effective teaching. Yeah, that's what I said. I agree with you, Michael. It's all those things bundled up into one big package for us. It, it's not an indicator of an effective teacher. It is a barrier to licensure, and that trickles down to being vacancies in the classroom and a teacher shortage. So it's all of those things, and I think you're right, we need to make sure we capture all of that because we're not doing it just in an isolated silo over here for one reason. I agree, this is fine. This is Robin, I agree too. We, okay. we found out from our study that it doesn't correlate with the standards necessarily that our elementary teachers are teaching. Um, right now, I've got a kindergarten teacher who has spent $600 of her money on taking the test and test prep programs. So, um, I would love to have that available for her now. Okay. So, so after uh, conferring with Mr. Snyder, uh, it appears that we can make the recommendation that it becomes effective upon approval by the State Board of Education. Which, which could potentially be February. So just a point of clarity, my assumption is, and I'll need uh, the commission to confirm that, is that you want what I would call a soft implementation. In other words, after the, after the state board passes this, if a teacher passed 203, you would still want them to be granted licensure as well yes. as p potentially pa passing CKT. Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct, correct. Okay. That's exactly correct. I think we're all in agreement on that. Great. Um, we could certainly um, amend as suggested. Great. Any other questions for Dr. Tom? Tom, can I just ask about 
um, the box underneath um, the red on page two where it says the Pearson general curriculum, the 701, are you going to cross that off? It's a combined. Because that's all of them bundled into one. Where is that? What are you talking about? Well, it's uh, the one test that they could take that's the multi subject and the math subtest all in one uh, that they could take. And we've already proven that that's not a valid, that the math subtest there is not a valid test. And we're going to use these others. Then would that box go away? I guess is my question it's on two, page two. two. And then again on uh, the EC one. So, yes, we can. I'm just trying to make this clear. We could remove that. Box, but I I would like to state for the record the that implementation. Pearson might disagree with us that that's not a valid test. Um, we we are choosing not to use the test for the purposes of licensure. So, uh, but yes, okay. We can. So, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, that's my goal. I want to keep them happy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, do we have a motion to approve the, the recommendation for the math content exam to be sent to the North Carolina State Board of Education in January? So moved. So, can I ask one more thing before we have, or do we need the motion? Because I have another so question. So, we have a motion. Before. I'm sorry. We have a motion. Okay. So, say it again. I'm sorry, Michael. Would you repeat it? So, the motion is to approve the recommendation for the math content exam to be sent to the North Carolina State Board of Education in January. This would include the removal of the um, multi-subject test. Does that, can that include the fact that it's about that Tom stated about, the, or does it need to include that Tom about the fact that the current it, 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 thing? It includes it. Yeah. We, will, we will. Okay, and I, I make that motion. It's been moved. Are you seconding? Second. I'll that motion. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and seconded. Do we have any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tom Rowland. Tom, before you leave, I have another question on page four of that policy. Yes. Tom, I'm sorry. No, no, so, no. On page, on page four and on page seven and eight, I thought somewhere when we first started as a commission, and Andrew may have to type in here, but that secondary shouldn't have to take the 5624 if they had passing a CPA score. It's in there. It's just not in there. And I don't see that on page four, and I don't see that on page seven with an asterisk underneath that the option is secondary would have to either take the 5624 or if they had passing the MTPA scores. Um, I don't see that as an asterisk or a caveat. So in, se in Roman numeral... Pulled a minute. So on page two under Roman numeral three, Principles of Learning and okay. Teaching Exemption for Ed TPA and PPAT, beginning on July 1st, 2018, yeah. a candidate will be exempt from the Principles of Learning and Teaching Assessment requirement if the candidate can produce evidence of a passing score on a nationally um, scored Ed TPA or PPAT assessment. So can that be included as one of the asterisks on the chart? on page seven, at the bottom of page seven, and or on the NTPA, TPAT um, scores there. I'm just thinking about our licensure people. Our LEA licensure people like to take this chart here and have it printed out and just sticking there so they can answer questions about licensure okay. instead of having to read through every word of the policy. I got you. So you would like another footnote to that table that indicates a passing score on these assessments uh, removes the requirement for the pre-professional, the PLT? Yes, please. We could do that. That's not substantive. That's just yeah. clarifying. So I, we, right. we, we, can, we can make that happen. Okay. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Tomlin. Next, we'll talk about the Administrative Procedure Act, the rules review process. 
Mr. Eric Snyder, General Counsel for the NC State Board of Education, will discuss the rules review process that is now a requirement for NCDPI policies that serve external stakeholders. Good morning, Commissioners. Eric Snyder here. Pleased to be here today um, to talk about everyone's favorite topic, the Administrative Procedure Act and, and permanent rulemaking. Um, <clears throat> This morning, we have a couple things I'd like to take the commission through. One, I want to set the table and, and talk about um, you know, why we're, in fact, talking about rulemaking today, provide you a little bit of history and context for this discussion, talk about a new analytical framework that the agency and the, and the PEPC will need to take on as we consider policies and rules, um, especially those that impact those outside of the uh, DPI building, and then talk a little bit about some recommendations about process for Pepsi as it moves forward in this new world. So we want to start uh, here at the beginning um, about our actors. Um, you know, as you all know, the State Board of Education has under our state constitution uh, the responsibility to supervise and administer our system, um, subject to the laws enacted by the General Assembly. This last line here in Article 9, Section 5 of the Constitution has been uh, the subject of some litigation, and we've got some clarity from our courts uh, about what that means, and in particular as it impacts uh, administrative procedures. Um, you know, the board, of course, acts through its policies and the rules um, that, it, that it enacts to, to meet those constitutional duties. Now, one of the key uh, pieces of legislation that we have to consider now is the Administrative Procedure Act. And as you may or may not know, this is uh, the law that the General Assembly has passed that outlines the process for agencies to establish regulations. And so this came about in the 70s. A lot of states implemented similar acts. There's a federal act, of course. Um, and the state created a Rules Review Commission back in 1986. Now, the goal for this act is it's all sort of good government work, right? transparent governance for agencies as they enact rules, a set of safeguards for procedure for those who are in, impacted by new regulations, a uh, process to allow for public input and comment. Um, if you pick up the administrative code, you'll see that there is uniformity. The rules look the same, so people know what to expect when they you know, pick up and try to pick up the rules and try to understand what, what applies to them. Um, also, it sets up safeguards to make sure that agencies are acting within, within their bounds, that they're not um, subjecting the public to overreach. So it's all in the name, right? This is a procedural act, and the Rules Review Commission that examines uh, rules offered by agencies really is looking at uh, the process by which an agency is promulgating those regulations. It's not about the wisdom of the rule, necessarily the substance of the rule, but the procedure, did you all go through the, the right steps to accomplish these, uh, these five goals that are listed on the screen here with respect to uh, uh, public comment? Does it look the right way? Do you have authority to make a rule if you're an agency? Okay. Um, so why are we talking about this today? Um, after, the mid, after the Administrative Procedure uh, Act passed, the state board uh, voluntarily participated in it and submitted rules to the Rules Review Commission, and you can find those in the administrative code today. Now, back in 2014, before Pepsi existed and before uh, I was here, uh, the State Board took a different view on this. It looked at its constitutional authority and said, you know, hey, we're a constitutional actor here. We have broad responsibilities. We should be able to, uh, we should be able to proceed accordingly. And sought clarity from the courts about what its obligations were uh, with respect to administrative procedure. Um, so they filed suit back in 2014 and sought court's clarity on that. Well, fast forward to this past summer in June, uh, the Supreme Court did indeed provide that clarity in a decision uh, that came down 5-2. Uh, and uh, you know, bottom line, the state board, as it enacts policies and rules, is subject to the Administrative Procedure Act. So if it wants to have a regulation that affects third parties, and it wants that regulation to have the force of law, it needs to go through the Administrative Procedure Act, just as other agencies do. Now, this is different than what the board had been doing. Essentially, its position for a number of years during 
uh, the litigation was that its policy manual had the force of law. And, and it acted in that way. So, um, some years removed from taking that position, we're in a new world now. Maybe it's the old world again, um, but under new circumstances. So, the board is, and, and others here in the agency and the Pepsi Commission and other advisory councils to the board have to think about their policies and guidance differently now. Um, now, does that mean that every piece of policy or guidance that the board wants to pass, that Pepsi wants to recommend, needs to end up in the administrative code and put in front of the Rules Review Commission? Well, the answer to that is no. Um, nevertheless, it is an important, uh, an important framework that uh, our agency is working on, our board is working on, this Pepsi group will as well. Um, so as you all make recommendations and as the board considers policy recommendations from the department and other stakeholders, it really needs to put those policies into one of three buckets. You know, is this something that really ought to be in the administrative code? Do we need a rule that functions like the law, that functions as law? Is it number two, an internal agency rule, a piece of governance? Or is it three, I've, I've got policy here in quotes, because we use throw around this word policy quite a bit, but policy means different things in different contexts, and with whom you're, it may depend on who you're talking to. Um, policy here would be guidance documents, best practices, um, ones that if we went into court, uh, don't have the same force that a law does. It's not a firm shall. This sort of breaks down, this, this is sort of the analytical framework on this next slide here on slide 10, just breaking down these um, buckets a little bit more. All right, so the court's ruling has, um, has those here in the agency and, and, and a lot of my colleagues both looking forward and also looking back. So what happens to those rules that exist in the state board's policy manual? Um, well, we already have some administrative rules that are on the books in Chapter 16 of the Administrative Code. You know, those rules that are already codified will be up for review uh, before, the uh, before the Rules Review Commission and the agency will be working with the Office of Administrative Hearings to facilitate that review. Um, but what about all those policies that are in uh, the board's policy manual that are online, including the licensure and EPP policies that are out there? Well, there's 324 of them, give or take uh, five or 10. Um, and those, those policies in the manual have been elevated uh, by statute this summer, through session law this summer, to have the status of interim rules. Essentially, um, House Bill 374 in this highlighted language uh, elevated the policy manual to the, to the level of rules to give the agency some time to begin migrating items in the policy manual to the administrative code. Not everything, just those items that really need, that, that rise to the level of, um, that rise to the level of rule or, or law. Now, the important piece to note here is that there is a, there is a timeline on, on, this, um, on this interim law stat, this interim rule status. Um, so the agency needs to take certain steps to take existing policies that it wants to move into the administrative code by May of next year. Um, so while we have the luxury of, you know, while the board's rules have the force of law at this point, uh, that that carriage turns back into a pumpkin um, in late spring next year. Um, now, time moves awfully quick. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, pleased that the General Assembly recognized a need to provide for some transition uh, for the board and this agency and, and uh, the recommendations that PEPC has made. Uh, but that May 19 date really is uh, it's some comfort, but it's maybe perhaps illusory comfort. Um, part of this process and moving items to the administrative code includes getting fiscal notes, so working with off, uh, OSBM to understand the, the cost of new rules. Um, that is a lengthy process and an in-depth one. Um, you know, while the Rules Review uh, uh, Commission staff has offered a great deal of assistance, that's going to take time to do uh, pre-reviews of, of rules that the uh, department and the board want to move over. Um, 
We also have timelines with respect to how the state board and Pepsi and other, um, other advisory committees meet. It's, it's, uh, it's not a lot of time. Um, also, there's significant agency capacity issues in accomplishing these goals. Simply, we haven't done this work for some time. We don't have people with uh, a great deal of experience who've done this previously. So, next steps. Despite those challenges, know that we are moving deliberately and with great energy um, to get this task done as best we can. Um, right now, staffers across the agency, including uh, those you're familiar with who are in this room, uh, are, are picking up policies that the board has passed, they're reviewing them, doing some analysis to figure out, you know, what bucket does this particular policy belong in? We really need to move this item to administrative, um, the administrative code. Um, is this a governance rule here at the agency, or is this just something that really is policy and, and best, best practice or guidance for, for those in the field? Um, I realize we're getting a bit astray here, but I think it's important for Pepsi to understand what's, what work is going on here at the agency because uh, it will inform the work that we're going to uh, do together for licensure and EPP policies. Um, but in any event, part of this work is looking at revision and repeal of policies that are no longer, um, no longer applicable or need some tweaks. Um, probably about the fourth bullet down is an important, is an important piece here as well. We're working to identify places where um, the agency would have a tar could ask for a targeted exemption to APA rulemaking. You know, where are there places where to accomplish good things and the best things for the state, um, we, we can make a solid case that the Administrative Procedure Act ought not to apply to particular work here at the agency. So, you know, as part of this process, as we think about licensure and EPP policies, um, staffers have already met with uh, the Rules Review Commission and its staff. The team over at uh, Office of Administrative Hearings has been uh, very helpful, um, uh, very supportive, and always available to answer the questions that we've posed already. Certainly the work that we do here creates work for them, um, so we understand that it's a, a journey we will take together as we deal with these, these um, policies and new rules. Um, I provided some additional resources for you all if you really want to dig in deep on these rules review questions over the, over the holidays or in your spare time, but OAH has a number of uh, resources that we're uh, using and, and, and staffers here at the agency are getting familiar with. And you know what this really means for DPI, for the state board, and for Pepsi is, is rulemaking is going to mean we need to think about timelines as, as we have to comply with the APA to get um, you know, get rules that have the force of law. We need to understand, you know, how we need to understand implementation dates. We need to be realistic about how long it takes to get a rule passed. Um, the implications of getting additional public notice. Uh, working with with those who can help us craft fiscal notes and better understand uh, the fiscal impacts of, of rules uh, that Pepsi would recommend to the board. Um, we also have to understand that. Um, Administrative Procedure Act provides perhaps uh, a great deal of certainty because the rules get locked in, but the trade-off is that we lose the agility to adjust to market conditions um, to address what's happening in classrooms now. So these are these are real um, you know, these are real challenges. Um, also, it means that if we're going to undertake, if we're going to recommend that the state board advance something to rulemaking out of Pepsi we're going to need to do some risk evaluation as well. Is this really a recommendation that needs to have the force of law? Do we need uh, the ability to defend the licensure decisions that folks may challenge um, because that policy is so important, that rule that, that Pepsi recommends is so important? The same is true with respect to um, setting up rules for accountability uh, for EPPs. Now, on this next slide, which I don't think anyone can see, even if they've got it on a printed out in front of them is a flowchart about permanent rulemaking. And just a slight diversion here, we, we, we go through a pretty, uh, I think a pretty tight communications loop between Pepsi and the state board. Um, this group was designed to facilitate um, public input, transparency, um, expertise, 
and all these topics that fall within Pepsi's jurisdiction. You all serve a great service for the board in providing these recommendations and really bringing to bear uh, input and expertise from you know, all corners of these, uh, these important issues concerning licensure, uh, teacher prep accountability, uh, work with higher ed and other um, education prep providers. Um, you know, our process now really kind of ends at the first box on this sheet, um, which, which if, you, if you squint closely, talks about agency action to propose text. I mean, for us, the rulemaking process would really begin after the, 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 step that, the steps that we go through here. Pepsi, you're making a recommendation, the board adopting it. Um, you know, we'd have to sort of figure out how to work in some work with respect to fiscal notes, talking about the impacts of particular rules. Um, but, you know, once the board blesses a recommendation and sends it forth, it essentially makes a decision to, to have it ready to be published in the North Carolina Register. Um, and then a long process begins to ensure those goals set out in the Administrative Procedure Act about public comment, about transparency, and the like. So, in some ways, this is not unlike going to the amusement park with your kids or grandkids, and you get in line, and you, you've made, if you sort of, you, you think you're at the front of the line with the work that you've done, and then you round the corner, and it's like, oh, okay, now the line really begins. Um, the, the rulemaking process can move um, as quickly as six months. Sometimes it can take up to 18 months. Uh, throw in complexity with the fiscal notes, um, and that can prolong the process even more. Um, which again creates challenges. So in any event, if you sort of work through the list here, and I won't touch on it exhaustively, um, you know, if, if Pepsi were to make a recommendation to the board and the board were to adopt, adopt it, assuming the fiscal note is in order, um, the agency publishes that text uh, in, in the North Carolina Register, there's a process then for public feedback and public comment, uh, the agency would then address comments provided by the public. We would need to work a way to have Pepsi understand and review some of those public comments. Many of them would probably be from your colleagues who you already represent, because we already have a process for um, providing input. Um, the board and Pepsi would address those public comments and then ultimately present them to the Rules Review Commission, um, assuming they decided to uh, proceed forward with the proposed recommendation. And then if you get to sort of the very bottom of this flow chart, you'll see that the, the, rules review, um, the Rules Review Commission has a number of options that it can take with respect to its rules. So, I mean, I don't think I could provide a, a higher level overview of the um, somewhat arcane rulemaking process. Um, but what that means is for any new recommendation that Pepsi would present to the board, this process or a temporary rulemaking process is what would need to occur after the board's blessing. Now, this is also the same kind of process that we're going to go through, you know, writ large for all those policies that live in the state board's policy manual that really need to be elevated to the administrative code. So you can imagine this is a, a daunting lift as we, we shrink that 300 plus policies to the workable appropriate number of, of rules that, that really do need to be in law. And, you know, I will say that the appetite here from talking with staffers and talking with the board members is we certainly do not want to move the entire manual over. That doesn't make any sense to do, but there are certain policies that really do need to make their way into the administrative code uh, for the board's policies and objectives to be, um, to be enforced in the, in the best way. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide here regarding Pepsi. Uh, of course, you all are uh, very aware of your role already. Um, what's particularly of, of mind to me here is that you all already involve stakeholders in this process from, from all corners of the state, from all sort of angles of these issues. You already bring to bear that expertise. Um, and, and you bring that expertise to bear on the rule recommendations that you make. Um, your, the recommendations you make may change as you operate in the shadow of the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, you know, when we talked about um, Pepsi's role in subcommittees back in the spring, you know, I've just basically copy pasted those, side, those, those initial bullet points, but have added this additional piece at the very bottom about 
PEPC providing assistance with respect to APA analysis. Uh, one of the things that this group will need to consider and can make recommendations on is, you know, is, this a, is, is, the, is the recommendation we suggest really one that ought to go into rulemaking? That ought to go through that process and end up in the administrative code. Um, you know, these next handful of slides sort of get really nitty gritty and wonky. I'm happy to talk with folks afterwards or online about these. Um, but the, the, the staff over at OAH has done some breakdowns for us on understanding differences between rules and policies. Again, this is part of the framework that we've been uh, adopting and understanding better here at the agency as we um, make decisions about what we ought to push forward uh, to the RRC. Um, one thing that a, a, an administrative rule is not is a restatement of the law. So we're, we're going to be very careful about that as we move forward. Uh, but as we look at the legislation for Pepsi and the board with respect to licensure and EPPs, it's very clear that it's, it's the job of these two groups to establish rules. So I think our default is going to be more often than not. We might want to move this through. We might want to move things through administrative rulemaking. At least that's my thought right now. We'll see as we move forward. Uh, but I'm going to give these next couple slides some short shrift. Um, but in any event, I, I do think it's sort of worth clarifying here that you know, those items that end up in rules, um, you know, again, they're not going to be about how Pepsi governs itself or how DPI governs itself. It's not going to be these, well, you think we, you should do something, school districts or IHEs or EPPs. I mean, these are really the, the, the shall sort of comments um, in, in these rules. Shall is the word shall as in you shall do something, is really the kind of item that, that would move forward through administrative rulemaking. Okay. Um, now, there are certain exceptions that have been granted to DPI and the board. And so the APA, this is, and this is here in 115C-270-15, for those keeping score at home, um, there is a recognition that with respect to uh, minimum cut scores on, on exams, that's a piece that doesn't need to go through rulemaking. There's been a recognition by the legislature that that's not the kind of thing that we want to move through um, through the APA process. Now, I imagine if we ran around the table in here, uh, commissioners would have plenty of ideas about uh, work that they think is similar in nature to these minimum kinds of cut scores that, that merit an exemption. Okay, so, so what next? Um, you know, at this point in time, as we've been um, working to understand and set, plan, set plans forth for addressing rulemaking here at the agency, uh, folks internally have done work to edu educate staffers here at the agency, uh, coach up the, the state board, and also FC. So we're doing that work of educating, um, educating folks here who are in this space. Um, as I mentioned, there's a broad review of the board's policy manual. Um, business owners throughout the agency are really digging in, in some, case, in some cases, blowing the dust off of policies that, uh, that need to sunset, um, identifying places where revision's appropriate, um, and then prioritizing certain, certain items that need to go forward through rulemaking. I think the consensus here is, with respect to licensure-related policies, you know, barring some sort of exemption, those are a very high priority for this agency. And to the extent there have been, you know, we're, we're doing um, some work with OSBM with respect to fiscal notes um, for existing policies and new ones. And we have some very strong assurances that fiscal notes will not be required to address those policies that were existing at the time the court's decision came down, um, but we're going to have to sort through with them, you know, what what policies may may require fiscal notes moving forward. Um, so business owners here across the agency are, are are sort of running through that analysis and doing that work. Um, we are also trying to identify the places of greatest need that need resources to get this done. Um, there have been requests in the budget to uh, bring in additional folks, 
uh, you know, a dedicated rules review coordinator, as every agency must have. Um, you know, right now we have uh, Dr. Deanna Townsend Smith in the board office filling the full time rules review coordinator role on top of her other full time role, which um, I think if you asked anyone is, is not sustainable. Um, so we're seeking additional positions and budget requests, and those were uh, talked about in the state board meeting, not this past month, but the month before. Also some internal discussion about repurposing some open positions to help staff up this important, um, this very important endeavor. Um, you know, long term, um, and, and perhaps by long term, I mean maybe next session, um, I think it's important for uh, members of the PEPC to, to think long and hard about what um, compliance with the APA uh, does to this group's effectiveness um, and, and perhaps consider asking for um, additional legislative fixes, I'll call them, or, or, or some sort of assistance with respect to this process. Um, universities, for example, are exempt from the APA. Query whether DPI and the State Board ought to get that, ought to seek out that kind of exemption as well. If that seems like too big of an ask, perhaps it's a, it's a request for more time to get this, get this work done. For this group that works on uh, the, the important issues of licensure and educator prep and has an apparatus that let me turn back my slides here, that accomplishes many of the same goals that the APA does. Transparent governance, procedural safeguards, a, me a method for public input and comment. Um, we can address issues of uniformity of what the policies look like, um, protecting against agency overreach. This Pepsi group accomplishes many of the things, if not all of the things, that the Administrative Procedure Act aims to um, aims to support. So query whether this group raises its voice with the state board to seek uh, a legislative, uh, seek legislative intervention with respect to rulemaking. Um, so those are some of the fixes that we're considering right now and are certainly open to others. Um, but again, over, over the short and long term, uh, the, the immediate need is to address those existing policies concerning licensure and EPPs move those forward and start that process to get, them, get those items in the administrative code that need to be in the administrative code, and then consider work forward and what that looks like, uh, adjusting to timelines, and the unique turnover of, of this group um, and the challenges that, that APA places on, on each of your short tenures with uh, PEPC, um, it will be difficult to see things all the way through. I mean, starting on day one, it may take 12, 18, 24 months to get some fixes through into the administrative code. Um, so having run through that, I, I'm happy to answer some questions and uh, entertain some discussion about rulemaking. I realize this is sort of a, uh, a high-level overview and one that talks a bit about Pepsi, but recognize that uh, the work that Pepsi does on this is um, the same kinds of inquiries that others throughout this agency are asking about their programs as well. And in particular, how the guidance that the board blesses and recommends and uh, puts into effect from uh, experts here at the agency, um, how the board best achieves its end, whether it's through guidance or whether it's through um, really prop promulgating a regulation as a force of law. So Eric, this is Glenda. May I ask you a question, please? Please. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. All right, so a couple questions. Um, I'm curious as to, um, with this presentation, is this any, in any way an indicator that the policies that we just recommended to go to the state board in January are going to be stalled from going until we can make a decision whether or not they're going to go into the administrative code? Well, it's a great question. Um, I, I think one of the big challenges with respect to the very complex and detailed licensure policies is trying to, trying to incorporate these important changes uh, while also moving 
the you know the previously agreed upon policies and sort of the infrastructure of this enterprise into the administrative code. Um, we're working internally to figure out what that fix looks like and how we move it forward. It's going to be challenging. Um, we're also sort of working to better understand. I'm sorry. I need to be clear on what you're saying. Are you saying that the policies that we just voted on go forward to the January State Board of Education meeting? are going to be delayed at DPI because we need to decide on whether or not they go into the administrative code. Whereas any other changes we've made to licensure policy, we've not done that. We've sent that we've sent those on the state board. Are you now saying that's going to happen? No, I, I will continue to move things from Pepsi to the state board. The, the question will be, you know, what for, for an outsider, what bucket does this go in? Is this just guidance from the agency? Or is this something with the force of law? And you know, I'll be I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I want to be very sort of circumspect um, here in a public meeting about what some of those consequences might be for those who might challenge agency, you know, board policy on some of these issues. Um, but the, the 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 shorter answer is, we're working towards a, a solution now, and those items that have existed do have the force of law at this point in time. And with respect to the policies that uh, y'all are recommending that the state board would approve, um, you know, many of those are going to, I think it sort of depends on your audience, right? Um, for those with an agency who are working on those recommendations, how they begin to implement them is one thing. Their value and force to the public is another. And I have to be careful about that because, um, you know, the Rules Review Commission and others have, uh, viewpoints about um, about how things ought to function while um, while a proposed rule moves through the process. Okay, so Eric, I agree with that. So the Rules Review Commission, I mean, we need to make sure that the viewpoints of superintendents in the state of North Carolina, uh, HR administrators in the state of North Carolina, and uh, principals, all of those in the field who have to implement these things on a day-to-day -day basis, that those are the viewpoints being considered. And then my second part of that question would be, who are the MCDPI business owners? Is this an organized group in the state that's actually looking at all the policies? Well, that's a great question. I think you already know your business owners with respect to the policies you see. Um, Kim, Andrew, and Tom, and, and uh, their colleagues, um, I will tell you that the legal office, um, ostensibly me and, and the new assistant general counsel who just joined us last week, uh, are also reviewing these policies. So you can imagine uh, the, the, if you read through, so this isn't just unique to the, the items that cross your desk, uh, Ms. Jones, uh, you know, across the agency, you know, those uh, business owners who come forward and offer policies to the board uh, in terms of in terms of asking for recommendations and for blessing, you know they're the ones who are doing this initial lift, uh, trying to categorize policies, and then uh, we will be working through legal to determine, you know, what really needs to move forward. Uh, but again, there is a, a significant agency capacity issue right now, as uh, we don't have a dedicated rules review coordinator position yet. Uh, we don't have an admin to support that person. Um, school business and, and others in accounting's ability and capacity to accomplish fiscal notes um, remains a significant challenge as they try to keep the wheels on, on this bus. Um, so I, I don't want to downplay the significant challenges that um, DPI is and the state board and groups like Pepsi are facing with respect to this process. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. Thank you very much. Now, Dr. Andrew Seiberg will present a bill that has been drafted regarding EPP performance data for discussion. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a couple slides on this. This is the uh, 2019 MK1. Um, what I'm going to do here is sort of walk through some highlights. Um, there's a little PowerPoint associated with it. Um, and then uh, what I'd like to do is, is uh, invite uh, Dr. Dempsey to share um, uh, 
some of his insights uh, as he's been uh, a part of some of the input process in this. But this is to uh, make sure that you're that you all are aware of what's happening over on the legislative slot side in terms of drafts that affect um, EPP accountability. So. Um, the first thing is, uh, in terms of the current accountability uh, expectations in 599, they're uh, listed on slide two there. there the, the accountability model needs to have performance on uh, teacher evaluations included, as well as EVOS, uh, where it's applicable. Um, results on uh, the, the recent graduate, uh, graduate survey, so folks that are just out of an EPP program uh, in their first year. Um, that's a survey that we collect. Um, and then the fourth component is uh, the quality of students entering the EPP uh, through their GPA or uh, pre-professional skills. So those are, those are four that are currently in law. And then this modified um, uh, law that's being sort of developed right now um, is including some additional layers of accountability. Um, and this is where uh, they're seeking input from a variety of stakeholders. One is, um, one of this, these new accountability measures is employment of EPP completers, including the number of students employed as beginning teachers under initial professional licenses within the first year of the completing program, of completing the program. And um, the second is the number of students retained uh, in the uh, profession and the perseverance of BTs in the profession. So how long they're staying as measured by um, their, their uh, employment uh, through the retirement system, that they're continuing to exist in their retirement system. Um, also in this, uh, these uh, changes is a small group ex ex exemption, uh, exception, sorry, um, and this is basically, we have institutions and EPPs that are very small, that have very small sample sizes, um, and so uh, this is allowing for the development of a model that will allow uh, and accommodate uh, and also hold accountable these small groups. Um, and that may include looking at data over multiple years. It's something that uh, I've brought uh, to this commission to consider uh, a couple of months ago. Um, uh, but the idea is if, you're, if your EPP is not producing enough um, data in the current year, can we look at data over multiple years to reach a, a, a significant sample size to be able to to talk uh, about the effectiveness of that EPP. Um, and then, uh, let's see here. The last is um, that the uh, that Pepsi, this organization, uh, as well as the state board, are charged with the development of the actual weighted model. So to look at the, um, the additional components um, that have been uh, brought forth in this uh, uh, potential legislation, um, as well as any other measures that, that uh, this commission and the subgroups that are working on it uh, deem uh, as uh, important in the process um, to, to sort of bundle that all together and create a weighted model. Um, and then that weighted model, while it's not necessarily enacted quite, quite yet, um, but the actual ironed out model should go in front of the Joint, joint Legislative Education Oversight Committee uh, by next fall. Um, and then that model, the weighted model, be applied um, uh, beginning in 2021. So that's what's actually written out and proposed. And um, I'd, I'd like to, uh, this is sort of a, an FYI, but I also want to in include Dr. Dempsey and his uh, conversations that, he, that he's had with um, NCDPI staff um, over the past couple of weeks about this as well and voice some of his concerns uh, and to sort of flesh out more of the story and context. Uh, Dr. Dempsey, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Um, the, uh, when the EPP subcommittee, uh, which includes Aaron Fleming, Megan Loftus, Ellen McIntyre, and myself, uh, had, a, had a meeting back in late November. Andrew and Kimberly and I had worked out uh, some of the framing of this and the draft of the legislation itself, and I had seen uh, and I believe that draft has been seen by representatives from the private institutions of higher ed and the UNC system institutions around the question of accountability for the EPPs. And so the subcommittee met, we had, I had a set of sort of general questions that language uh, issues and concerns I had already sent back. But we also had feedback that came in from the institutions of higher education. 
subcommittee met on the 26th, and some basic elements of, of our conversation the was already cited, but I did want to mention that there were a few that came out of the conversation with the subcommittee around how accountability mechanisms and some speeches like uh, some elements of preparation like password management, future support, coaching, uh, the avoidance of single measures or loading too many measure. We also have talked about and uh, Andrew and we have sent out some examples of the information we already have available to DPI relative to accountability. The, there are four required areas that are in the legislation on page 9 of the bill 599. Uh, if you go back and look at that, we can look at the subcommittee. We also had questions about how expectations in 599 map to the draft legislation. Examples that have been uh, pulled from other states, and I think Andrew, that came from SREB. Uh, yes. That in front of me. Yeah, that was a the, the SREB did an analysis of uh, uh, accountability models um, from uh, I think seven or eight different states, um, and so that subcommittee has. Um, that data, uh, SREB uh, pr provided that uh, information to us in kind, so um, we were able to, to share with the sub subcommittee how are other states uh, looking at accountability um, as we think about our own accountability model. And then um, one last piece to mention, we talked about in the subcommittee how for, for the public institutions, for example, in our, the expectations of our accrediting body they either map to and speak to what might be expected under this legislation or where there are gaps, what's not cited. So we would have those examples from other states. We would have uh, data, it was seven um, data components that have been identified by DPI that we talked through in the uh, in subgroups, in the subcommittees were, then what some of those uh, elements that are in common with the accrediting body. I look like, and so I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, Andrew, that the challenge before the sub, our subcommittee, and the subcommittee, I can't remember the formal title, uh, Andrew Lockers, if you're there, what the, or Andrew Cyber, what's the title of the other subcommittee? I think that's the accountability uh, subcommittee. No, assessment, uh, assessment. assessment and performance, sorry. Assessment and performance. We thought that you, the chairs across the subcommittee to talk with Andrew, that we understand. How the work that the subcommittees are complementing each other, and I'm actually going to say their conference call. I think it was uh, mm -hmm. um, and the subcommittee has come back to the commission many times as we work through the expectations of the timeline that it represents. Hey, you're trailing off a little bit, Dr. Dempsey, if you could be a little closer to the mic. Yeah, the, um, the last piece was about timeline. We've got these two subcommittees that are going to be working parallel to each other at some point. They will merge in terms of the substance of the subcommittee, but our goal is to not meet the expectations. If we have to meet the timeline in the spring of 2019 to set up for the uh, benchmarks that happen later. With And others, others on the subcommittee, please feel free to that. Um, and then Andrew, did I miss me of major point? No, I think that's I think that's uh, I think that helps flesh it out a little bit. Are there any questions about this? No. I think I would just uh, so I I've looked at this bill already, mm -hmm. and I would encourage others to to take a look and provide some feedback. Um, I have a number of issues with it, particularly if we're going to call it a performance dashboard, and then to include a number of input measures that are unrelated to performance. Um, in particular, you know, just as an example, on page two, uh, you know, the number of students who apply, admit, or retain, that has nothing to do with performance. Uh, so we've got issues there, and then I think there are additionally some issues in which uh, EPPs can't be held accountable. Beyond two years in the field, the impact of the EPP, that, that's beyond our control whether or not someone stays in the profession after two years. Uh, I think that's a that's an unfair um, Michael, I can't hear you. Would you say, it's up to you. what is beyond our control? 
the, whether or not a candidate or, or a graduate remains in the field beyond two years, that once they get past that two-year point, uh, yeah. there, there are a host of school factors that determine whether or not someone remains in the profession or, or within a given school. Uh, I, just, I just don't think that's a good measure by which to evaluate uh, teacher prep programs. So in addition to these input measures, there are some things beyond our control. And then I think thirdly, finally, there are some other issues that we are already required to report either through federal Title II or through the IHE performance report. This just adds more reporting requirements on individuals at EPPs who are already completing multiple reports. Um, and I'm not convinced anyone reads these reports. Um, so that, that's just my kind of personal feedback. Michael, um, this is Dan. Uh, that issue that you just raised, among others, has come up in a great conversation. There have been questions so far about the structure of the data collection process, and so what's going to be on the institution, what's going to, what can be done at the central level, and how it's related to the dashboard. Uh, you know, questions about resources as to how to fund that. The benchmarking part of the process, and the way the legislation reads right now is the necessity target these others, so how do you perform, how does institution A perform relative to institution B versus performance relative to a standard of practice. So the comparative aspect of that really doesn't tell us much about quality. It says something about how institutions are performing relative to each other. Uh, the issue you just mentioned about which points to context, so the way some of the variables kind of play out around attention, for example, will be contingent upon the district in which the candidate teaches, and what resources are available, what kind of professional development supports are going to be available to the, uh, on behalf of the candidate once the candidate goes into a position. Um, the time, issues of time, so how much, how long after the candidate uh, three years versus uh, what another time frame might look like. And, and then flesh it out language around words like co uh, corrective and Science. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? What does it mean for the EPP? What does it mean in terms of what the support mechanisms that go into place would be when an EPP is not in compliance? Yeah. So that's, a, that's a handful of issues that have already put right out of this. And I expect we will bring to the board back. Thank you, and, 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 I, and I think it's important just for me to note, right, right so, so I'm not opposed to strong accountability for teacher preparation, I think I've mentioned that multiple times in, in these meetings, and I'm not opposed to a dashboard, per se. Uh, I think that's actually a good thing for us to have a dashboard. I, I just want to make sure that the, the dashboard is, it, it captures the right information that's, that's actionable for teacher prep programs, data that we can actually use for continuous improvement. So that's it for me, thank you. Um, I, I, I know that uh, uh, Dr. Tomlin wanted to uh, uh, add two points uh, regarding EVOS, if it's okay to sure. welcome him back up. So I, I apologize not to get not getting this directly to Dr. Seiberg before his presentation, but I did want the commission to be aware that the reference to EVOS, <coughs> um, it references performance and growth. So EVOS doesn't measure performance. Yeah. And I would, in proficiency rather, mm -hmm. and I would question whether we would want proficiency to be a measure in the placement of student teachers, unless the intent is you get more points for placing teachers in lower proficient schools, which presumably is the uh, which runs counter to Dr. Bastian's research that we heard a couple uh, months ago. Uh, so that's something that I think the commission should provide feedback on. The second is. The, uh, I question the active contributing members in the North Carolina State Employment Retirement System as the measure. We, we have really good records on payroll for any public school. This would effectively eliminate the placement of your teachers in charter schools and not give you credit for charter school performance. Thank you. Any additional comments? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Seiberg. Thank you, Commission members, advisors, and staff for your preparation for the discussions. I remind Commission members that our next standing meeting will be held in this room on Thursday, January 17th from 9 a.m. to noon. We have now completed our meeting, and unless there is additional business at this time, I ask for a motion to adjourn.
We have a motion. Is there a second? Second? Who is the motion? Glenn. Thank you. And the second? Aaron Fletcher. Okay. It's been properly moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are now adjourned. Thank you.